The auspice that you were born under says a lot about you. It basically defines who you are as a person or characteristics that you might have. An auspice is a phase of the moon. This auspice will also determine your role in werewolf society. Your auspice is your outlook on life, and it's technically also your job description. Whatever a werewolf's reaction is to their auspice doesn't matter because it's theirs for life. Starting off with the full moon, this is also known for the warriors. The Arun are frontline soldiers in the war against the worm. An Arun does not shrink back from battle. Instead, they seek it out. They crave it. They need it. Although it's not a bloodlust. Not all who crave and seek battle are Arun, and not all pacifists are not Arun. And this doesn't mean you can't find an Arun in a group of pacifist werewolves. It's unlikely, but it's still possible. For the Arun in its purest essence, its most simple boiled down bits, they seek competition. In the Arun's eyes, battle is the best way to do this, but it is not the only way. In battle, it is the truest form of testing oneself. How good is their skill, their strength, their speed, even their toughness? And believe it or not, self-control plays a factor in this, even though we're talking about the Guru. Because of this mentality, the Arun tend to know their own personal limits pretty well. And when you know your limits as well as an Arun does, you know when you can push things and when you need to back off. The Full Moons believe they can do this better than anyone else. And although an Arun is particularly useful in battle, this doesn't mean that they have no uses outside of battle. For the Full Moons, who run Karens or are part of Karens that are not currently at war, they will be shoring up defenses, training, they will be gathering intelligence on perceived threats or enemies. And in some cases, if they believe that the leadership of that particular Karen is coming into question or they don't trust their motives, they feel that maybe they could do better, this is when you will run into those challenges for Karen leadership. The Full Moons also know that information and knowledge is power. So while they are good at combat and removing weak leaders, they are also not stupid. They will make allies or friends with the Crescent Moons or the New Moons, who are great intelligence gatherers. The Gibbous Moon, the Moon Dancer, this is the Galliard. Werewolves born under the Gibbous Moon, they are storytellers, pure and simple. They are the most passionate of the auspice signs. They seem to have limitless energy. They inspire entire clans. They inspire their packs with their stories. They commonly bring those heading towards the path of Hirano out of the depression. In order to do this and to be so inspiring to not only themselves, but to their pack mates, they must know themselves. They must also have a very clear understanding of what the goals are, meaning of course their own personal goals and that of their pack or the Karen that they serve. The Gibbous Moons also tend to be quite artsy. Not only are they storytellers, but they are musicians, they are artists, they are dancers. They are fantastic actors. A Ronin Galliard with no audience and no pack to inspire, they are a pathetic creature to behold. There are those who say that the Galliards are glory hounds. They are self-serving in their interests. They're full of hot air. And while this certainly is the case for some, it is not the case for all. Fame and glory are not for the weak-willed. In order to attain glory, it requires action of some sort. In order to maintain the fame, it requires a strong mental capacity to not let it bring you down or inflate your ego. There are many tricks that the Galliards have to not let their own sense of self-worth get in their way, but it's the Galliards' passion that is their main driving force in what they do. This makes them very useful on the battlefield because their passion drives them. They have a very solid reason for going to combat, going to fight. They have a strong why, as some might call it. Why being a reason to do what you're doing. The Galliards are also a bit lavish or flamboyant in their presentation. They try to add their own personal style in everything that they do, be it combat, acting, singing, 
Whatever it is, it must be dripping with their own personal brand. Because anything worth doing is worth doing to have a great story afterwards. Something that is commonly overlooked with the Galliards is when they seek glory or when they tell a story that builds them up, they will commonly build up their packmates. To a Galliard, glory is great, but glory shared is better. And it's through these methods, through these attitudes, that the Galliards build themselves up, build their packmates up, and push everyone, not only in their pack, in their Karen, in the nation, towards greatness. The next phase of the moon cycle would be the half moon, the philodox, the judges, chaos, order, light, dark, good, and evil. All of these extremes have a very thin line that separate them, and the philodox, they stand on this line. It's a philodox's job to act as the mediator. They are great negotiators. And they also tend to fall in positions of judgment, which is where they get the judge's moniker. Philodoxes are great communicators. It's their job description. If you have a philodox who can't communicate, they're basically useless. It's not uncommon for a philodox to learn multiple languages. Some will do this by traveling to other Karens and learning from those more experienced. Some will enroll in universities and courses. Some even take online courses. The job of the philodox to be the mediator, the negotiators, the judges within a Karen, they don't take this responsibility lightly. When there's an accusation that's made, they will listen to both parties. They will review any and all evidence. Once they have come to their conclusion, they will then give their judgment or their verdict. The potential downside to this is philodoxes use their own judgment, their own world views and experiences to arrive at their conclusions. This is formed through their own worldview. So decisions and judgments can have a bit of a variance between philodox. For those who would bring their accusations to a half moon, if there is any lies, misrepresentation, or falsehoods, the half moons have particular skills that they can use to cut through the BS, basically. It's rare that you can throw a philodox off its game, but it does happen. For minor infractions, punishments can range from acts of servitude or reparations to the damaged party. The half moons believe that hard work is a great teacher. For bigger crimes or bigger transgressions, there are punishment rights. And many philodox will know various amounts of punishment rights. And if they are not facilitating the right themselves, then they are overseeing those who are performing the right. And unfortunately, there are some crimes that are so great when they are committed by the guru, the only form of atonement that can be made is death. It's rare that this form of punishment is dealt out considering the plight of the Guru Nation, but there's only so much you can do. It should come as no surprise that balance with everything that a Philodox tends to not have problems with losing control of their rage. Now, when it comes to an auspice that's particularly scary and one that you don't necessarily want to piss off, you're looking at the Theurge. These would be the Crescent Moons, also known as the Seers. A theurge is wise in the ways of the Umbra. They are well versed on its spiritual inhabitants, and they tend to make lots of allies in the umbral realms. It's entirely possible that older werewolves, older seers, have spiritual armies at their disposal. What makes them so scary is that if you threaten a werewolf, you have to deal with the werewolf, the pack, and the Karen. If you threaten a Theurge, not only do you have to deal with the Karen, the Pack, and the Werewolves, you also have to deal with whatever spiritual armies and allies that they had. And if you're not very spiritually atoned, you can't defend yourself against what you can't see or perceive. Now, having access to this spiritual army isn't just something that happens. Elder Theurges tend to be quite odd. Their behavior is not crazy, but it is definitely eccentric. Their odd behavior is a direct result from the bonds that they form with their spiritual allies. They have to do certain things. They have to perform things that would be considered strange in the normal world to appease and keep their spiritual allies. 
Not everything is the same because every spirit is slightly different. And when it comes to first changes, those of the Theurge are the weirdest. Before their first change, a Theurge might notice that they've misplaced a lot of things or something that they know that they set in a specific spot is moved. This is because of their spiritual awakening that is happening. They may feel like they're being watched or something mundane has a very irrational explanation. This is them gaining the attention of spirits and the spirits will mess with them. These spirits are doing it not because they're malicious, but that's just because that's what spirits do. Think about it like this. If a Theurge finds that their laptop has died and instead of replacing parts or figuring out what went wrong, they will know for sure that something in the machine shorted out. Some spirit in the machine was messing with them and they will completely take it apart in almost a fit of rage to find it and prove that it was some spirit or something. All of this happens to them slowly driving them mad until they have their change, realize that there's an entire spiritual realm that they now have access to, and everything makes much more sense. The new moon, the trickster, is the next moon phase, known as the Ragabash. Ragabash are questioners. They are tricksters, playful tricksters, mind you. They tend to ask questions. They tend to ask why a lot. They do it not in a malicious way. They do it because they want to understand that there's sound reasoning behind a decision that is made or a law that's been put in place or just something that happens on the regular that it makes sense. This can definitely come off as satirical. It can come off as purely disrespectful as it does happen whenever you question authority. So there's a very fine line that the Ragabash walk. They do tend to get a little bit more leeway when it comes to the elders around their questions because that's just who they are. But there is two guidelines that a Ragabash should follow to prevent themselves from getting in trouble. The first being the questions must have some kind of purpose. Their questions, their challenges to authorities or challenges to plans must come from a place of genuine concern and genuine curiosity. It wouldn't do to have a Ragabash speak out against a plan that clearly has some holes in it. So while their questions must have purpose, they must come from a place of wanting genuine improvement. It is for the purpose of building up, not tearing down. It is not uncommon for a Ragabash to forget this rule or this guiding principle and then have beatings until the morale improves. The second being that they must know their limits. Do they get a little bit of extra leeway when it comes to their questions and their quick tongues? Yes. Yes, they do. Does this mean that they can say anything they want at a Karen or a moot or some kind of formal meeting? No. As long as the new moons keep these two guiding principles in mind, they should be all right. And although these rules and guidelines seem simple, they are not as cut and dry as one might think. All of these limits, they must be adhered to within the rules and the values and the principles of the Karen that they are staying in. What works in one may not work in another. This could be very difficult if you're a traveling Ragabash. It's not uncommon for traveling Ragabash to make powerful enemies because they said something stupid or they didn't understand the way that a Karen does things. The ones who don't learn or are unlucky tend to have not a lot of friends. They don't travel in a pack. The ones that do learn and sometimes just get lucky, they do find friends. They do find pack mates. They understand that everyone serves a purpose and they must let them fulfill their purposes. Older, more experienced Ragabash, they tend to take new Ragabash, new, new moons. That's an interesting sentence to say under their wing, and then they guide them. They teach them the ways and they will teach them through hard lessons. They will teach them through trickery and through mockery. This is the only way that the Ragabash know how to teach lessons and they do it to each other, but they also do this to other members of the Guru Nation. And when they're doing their lessons, the answers are not usually straightforward. There's usually some thought that needs to go into the process to extract the answer. Basically, they're not very direct. Now, if you combine all of these auspices that we've just talked about with the tribes of the Guru Nation, there's some interesting personalities that can come from this. If you'd like to learn a little bit more about the tribes of the Guru Nation, then click on the playlist on your screen now. 
I would like to thank my brand new patron for joining the channel, Flynn Trojan, welcome to the table. My name's Nathaniel, thanks for stopping by everyone.